Uh, I was just looking through the bulletin at all the people that were on the, on the sick list and everything, those that need our prayers. Uh, you can take me off of your list. I am no longer uh, going through uh, physical therapy for my back. Uh, not blaming the physical therapy, but uh, it's been worse since I took the therapy than before. So uh, I'll, I'll hopefully get back to my normal soon. Uh, Andrea is still not with us today. She's on the on the sick list, so she wasn't on there. I think everybody else is on the on the sick list, but we do need to keep in our thoughts and prayers, Brother Moody, that's going to have the up, upcoming consult and surgery, and uh, always keep Brother Terry, since he's going through all he's going through. Is there anything else that we need to? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Again. Okay, if y'all did not hear that, Brother Bert uh, Turner has is at the VA with pneumonia again. So, uh, yes, sir. I mentioned Paul Copps, that friend of ours that I used to work with, uh, having cancer. They took him up to Birmingham and did a couple of treatments, and they weren't really having any effect at all. That tumor is still growing very quickly, uh, and it's gotten to the point they've actually gotten him on what they call comfort care there. Yeah, that that was the bone surgery, the hip surgery, uh, hip, right? Yeah, okay. Any anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Don't don't worry about seeing all that. We had an EMG on Friday that did show some kind of blockage. They don't know what yet. They call it gastro. It's still doing a neurological consult. Um, he did get a couple of cards that you could look at that and just keep that at your thoughts. I don't know if he's going to have it. But it's 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 still on. Okay, and if y'all did not, uh, if you got the email, uh, he would appreciate some cards, uh, and he enjoyed those. So, uh, Brother David, would you lead us in a prayer, please? God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. You named several that were in need of prayers. Uh, we ask that you be with them. God, we know that there are some that you have helped recently, and we pr pray thank you for that. We thank you for your blessings every single day. God, we thank you for this opportunity to study from your word. We ask that you be with Larry and the rest of us as we go through what you've planned and uh, lead through your word for guidance and to help us to understand you better and the things that you desire of us better. God, we ask that you watch over us as we go to our homes and as we, as we return this evening to be with each other. In your son's name that we pray. Amen. Today's discussion is going to be about, uh, supposed to be, why aren't you working? There we go. About dinosaurs, dinosaurs in the Bible. Uh, <clears throat> last week I had shown a couple of extracts from a from a film called as Genesis History. I've got a section of that today that's about 13 minutes long, if we can get to it and get through it. It does not so much talk about dinosaurs in the Bible or language around the Bible, but it goes into the timing of dinosaurs, not the 65 million years old, but how they are uh, could be much more current. So it's to me it's really a great, Great piece, but we'll just see if we can get there. Uh, when we talk about dinosaur in the Bible, now you will not find the word dinosaur in the Bible. That was a word that was coined in about 1841 by a fellow by the name of Richard Owen, and he called it dinosauria. However, there are things in the Bible that we can describe that would meet that qualification because what people call something that is today called a dinosaur if they didn't know the word dinosaur. Uh, because literally the definition is that it is a great 
powerful, wondrous creature. Now, when you see a dinosaur and people talk about them, what's the first thing you see? They automatically go to those 30, 40, 50 foot creatures, tons and tons of weight. But when you get right down to it, the average size of what falls in the category of dinosaur is about the size of a calf because they range everywhere from small chickens all the way up to the big T-Rexes. And today, because of the classification, the way they classify dinosaurs, we are living with dinosaurs today. They're present all around us today. They call birds dinosaurs. So we need to look at that. But prior to 1841, basically, <clears throat> The common definition or the common thing that you would think of on the description of a dinosaur would be a dragon. And they go all the way from, like I say, 245 million years to about 65 million years ago. And people have been taught in school, even when I was in school a uh, long time ago, but that all the dinosaurs were, went extinct when this great big meteorite hit the earth and changed everything. We have been so indoctrinated with the idea of evolution that most non-Christians and even a lot of Christians, they don't question evolution. They don't question that their things took so long to do. It's just accepted as a scientific fact. Now, my grandfather on my dad's side did not go to school. He could not read. He could not write. From the time he was old enough to kick clods of dirt, his dad had him working on the farm. He did not believe that dinosaurs ever existed, even though when I was young and had the books and showed the, the dinosaur fossils and all, it didn't happen. So there's things he believed in God. He believed he was a Christian but he couldn't accept the fact that there were dinosaurs because of all this, the rhetoric that goes around. Now, Brother Curtis Cates in 1994 published a book called The Noic Flood. And in that, here is a quote from him. People are constantly being bombarded with atheistic, evolutionary, humanistic philosophy. From the time that dinosaurs are introduced to preschoolers and elementary school children until those graduate with a terminal degree, they are indoctrinated with the supposition that the universe is tens of billions of years old, that life began over a billion years ago, that dinosaurs preceded man by over a million years, and that eight men inhabited the earth millions of years ago. This God-denying, Bible-rejecting philosophy is also taught in the media. Satan has done a wonderful job of creating or sowing the seeds of doubt. And if you think about it, the seed of doubt is one of Satan's most powerful tools. If you recall, what was the tool that he used in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, 1 through 5? He asked Eve what did God say this? And she said, we're not to eat of trees, not to touch them. She added that phrase. And then what did he say? You shall not die. God knows that you'll be smart if you eat that tree. So he planted the seed of doubt in Eve, and we know the rest of that story. So as Christians, the first thing we need to do is understand that God's word is the absolute truth and authority that we need to go to and lean on. If we look at Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Wherefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, 
Paul was talking to the Ephesians about 2,000 years ago, but today we are still confronted with those same things. In Bert Thompson's book, Creation Compromises, um, this was, I think, 2000 or 2005. I can't remember the exact date on that. But he made this comment. Give a man a false, warped view of his origin, and he will likewise possess a false, warped view of his destiny. So to me, origin and destiny, those are inextricably linked. You have to understand one before you can understand the other. When we look at Genesis 1, 21 through 31, we're not going to, I want you all to read this on your own. We're just going to hit a few of the highlights. But in verse 21, it says, God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. God created everything in the water, everything in the air. Verse 24, God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures after his kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after his kind. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And then when you skip down to verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So everything on this planet, in the water, in the air, on dry land, God created, and God said it was very good. When we then go to Genesis 6 and 17 through 22, uh, this is where the flood was about to happen. We've gone through this a couple of different times, different ways. But in essence, it says that when Noah and his family members and a breeding pair of every air-breathing thing on this earth entered the ark, that means and includes those things that we now describe as dinosaurs. Everything that was alive in the pre-flood antediluvian period, everything went on that ark except the things in the water. And all the land creatures outside the ark died during the flood, but the representatives of all the kinds that survived on the ark lived in a new world, and we've gone through that talking about the change between how things were in the old world and the new world. And those land animals, including dinosaurs, found the new world to be a much different than the one before the flood. Now, we know because of all the archaeological digs and everything else, the, the fossil finding, that there was a mass burial of things at one time they called dinosaurs. So I have often been asked, well, if all that was on the ark, and then they came off the ark, why aren't they around now? Well, if you just look at the, any publication that deals with science, National Geographic, et cetera, how many things go extinct on a daily basis? There are things going extinct every day. There are also things that, we're, that scientists are finding that they didn't know existed almost every day. So, last week we had discussed how the rapid changes take place on the earth instead of things gradually changing over a long period of time. As an example, this photo here is from 2009. It's in the National Geographic. It's the Murray-Darling Basin, which is in the interior of the southeastern part of Australia. And y'all say, big deal, desert in Australia. Well, five years ago, it was a pasture land that had dairy cattle on it, about 500 head of cattle that it supported. Major drought over a couple of years. 
So what happened to a lot of the creatures that came off the ark and started multiplying, what happens when the things change so rapidly that they can't migrate and the food sources go away? What would have happened to the cattle if there had not been somebody there to round them up and get them on trailers and haul them someplace else? They're going to die. So let's look at a few things in Scripture that talk about things that we can identify today as a dinosaur. The word tannin, T-A-N-N-E-E-N. In Ezekiel 32 and verse 2, the King James Bible translate the word whale from tannin. Tannin actually means a marine or land monster, that is sea serpent or jackal, dragon, sea monster, serpent, or whale. So the King James uses whale. The New King James uses monster. The ASV uses monster. The ESV and RV says dragon. And the modern King James Version uses sea monster. When you then look at Genesis 1 and verse 21, King James is consistent. Again, they use the word whale. The New King James uses the word sea creatures. Again, the ASV and RV use sea monster. The ESV uses sea creatures. And the modern King James uses sea animals. Job 7 and verse 12, King James is a whale. The new King James is a sea serpent. And the new revised standard version is dragon. ASV, ESV, and RV are sea monsters. Then when you look at the word tana, which is a little bit different spelling, a little bit different meaning, uh, it's talking about a female jackal or a dragon. So the King James in Esau uses the word dragon. It translates tana, tana uh, as dragons. The New King James as jackals. The RV, ESV, also uses jackals. When we get to Leviathan, a wreath animal, a sea, a, a serpent, especially the crocodile or some other large sea monster. Figuratively, the constellation of the dragon, also a symbol of Babylon, Leviathan, and mourning. The King James, New King James, NRSV, the NASB use the word Leviathan in the following verses. Job 41 and 1, the Leviathan. Psalms, Leviathan. Psalms again. <coughs> then here you can tie it together. In Isaiah 27 and verse 1, it says, In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, the crooked serpent, he shall slay the dragon. So all those terms are related about that one thing that we mainly read in Job about the Leviathan, the thing in the water. Then we come up to Behemoth. Uh, it basically is a large quadruped, a beast, cattle, but really a singular of the Egyptian deriv derivation, a water ox, the hippopotamus, or the Nile horse is a behemoth. So if we just look at some verses in Job about the behemoth, and it talks about in verse 15, it eats grass, the strength is in its loins, its tail like a cedar, Bones are strong, chief of the ways. So, 
do we recognize today any creature on this planet that eats grass, has strong loins, tail like a cedar, strong bones, and chief of the ways? Now they want to go to one, the hippopotamus. Well, if you ever see a picture of a hippopotamus, it ain't got a very big tail. Can't possibly have a tail like a, like a cedar. And by the way, anybody know what they call a, a group of hippopotamuses? Uh, this is just a side note, they call it a bloat. So I think I've found my family. Then we go to the Rim, which is a wild bull, conspicuousness, a unicorn. Now we know that mythically what unicorns are like, but depending on which culture you go to, uh, they can either be those things that you never find or those things that help you out. In Numbers 23 and 22, God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. We'll cast uh, Job 39, 9. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by the crib? In verse 10, thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow, or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Uh, got to this section here. So this, like I say, this is about 13 minutes long. I think it's very interesting, uh, not much action, but one of the things I want you to pay particular attention to is where they are digging and finding the dinosaur bones. If dinosaur bones were 65 million years old when they went extinct, why are they able to dig just below the surface on top of a high hill to find the bones.
incredibly small. You know, this is our 20 micron bar here. See how small these structures are? Still intact. Yeah. It would take very little to break them. Mm. So at best, you would expect that all that would have broken off and been long gone. Mm. So that has has to have shaken up the scientific community. What has been the response of all of this? The initial response when Dr. Schweitzer first published her work which is what became very popularized in 2005, it generated a lot of response. And so initially, some of the reaction was rejection. Oh, it's contamination. You know, those are, that's a really dinosaur. It's bacteria, because bacteria can look kind of strange sometimes. So you had a lot of proposals of what it could be. And to her credit, Dr. Schweitzer did more work. They began to find protein. You break open some of these cells. You look in the, at the matrix these cells are attached to, and they're proteins. Okay, so once that is uh, understood, yes. then what happens? Now this is shaking it up. That becomes part of the controversy because clearly you're now faced with how could you explain the survival of this, the pristine survival of this, not only for so long, but in very unpristine conditions. And so then the controversy has been, how do you explain it? And if you read some of the literature, there's almost like desperation of it because they recognize what the implications of this could be. Now, some people would say, well, it means nothing because we know how old they are, and therefore it just means it survived somehow, big deal. But how do you know how old they are? Well, you use methods, supposed methods of dating. Well, this is a method of dating. The tissue itself can be discounted as part of the method of dating. So why do you say that doesn't count, but this does count? Well, it's all the paradigm drives your conclusions. The paradigm is it has to be old. Therefore, methods that give us an old fossil are what we choose. Something that doesn't give us an old fossil, like tissue, we have to reject or explain away. At least to me, and I, of course, I'm not a microbiologist, but I think most people uh, would say, well, that, that just seems reasonable to think that maybe these are not that old. Clearly, this is in violation of the dating process. It challenges the entire dating process. If the fossils of dinosaurs have been dated incorrectly, and I would say this is clear evidence they have, then it's very likely the fossils of any organism have been dated incorrectly, and therefore then the geologic ages themselves are incorrect. What you're saying is that if you pull out the notion of a long period of time, uh, you're pulling out a major foundation uh, for the conventional paradigm. Absolutely. In fact, time is the critical component for evolution. If you're going to say that a simple cellular system became a multicellular system that then became fish, and the fish then jumped up on land and grew legs and started breathing air, and then that creature grew feathers and wings and started flying. So if you give us time, we'll claim to account for all of this massive change of organisms. But we gotta have the time. Everything seemed to come back to the question of time. I remember Andrew saying that Charles Darwin accepted millions of years first, then fit his theory of evolution to that assumption. Why is time such an important element to evolution? Now, if you also notice in that film, at the very beginning of the film, uh, where the, the dig was, and I said it was on top of the surface, basically, just under the surface, if you notice, the scientists still called it the Cretaceous layer. And Cretaceous was the 65 million year to about 105 million year ago time. So the upper part would have been closer to the 65 million years. But if that be true, why is it on top of that hill and that goes back to what we looked at last week about how volatile this earth still is with all the earthquakes and the, and the volcanoes and the shifting of everything. So you can't just go start with the very top and go down and say you're getting that far back. Now I've got a few photos to close things out here. Remember I mentioned Tanal, the, the, the wreath 
creature? Everybody see one of these little things? Is this what they referred to as the Leviathan? I don't think so because it's only about this long. So, but it. And the crocodile. A lot of people today still refer to these as living dinosaurs. Now, technically, they do not fit the description, fall in the description of a dinosaur because of the, the, the hip placement and, and legs and the way things work. But still, uh, if you look at the, in Job, the verse in Job, could we think about that with teeth all around, scales so close and that you couldn't get a spear through? These things are very difficult to kill. And, and actually, there's only one kill spot, technically, that, that you go to for a quick kill. And that's on top of their head, just, just behind their eyes, right in the center of their skull. That's the, that's the weak spot for a kill shot. Uh, when we get to Job 41, verses 18 through 21, talks about his sneezing flash forth and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lights, sparks of fire shoot out, smoke goes out of his nostrils. As from a bowl, boiling pot and burning rushes, his breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. So is it possible for there have been a fire breathing animal of any kind. I don't think we can rule it out because if you recall two or three weeks ago we talked about the bombardier beetle, how it mixed chemicals and ejected those chemicals, uh, was very accurate, but they left at 212 degrees, the boiling point. So if a little beetle can spit something out uh, at boiling point and survive, uh, could something bigger do something else? There are some paleontologist evidence that a skull arrangement could have accommodated fire breathing. Uh, in his book, Dinosaurs by Design, 1992, Dr. Dwayne Gish discusses how the Hattosaurus nasal cavities could easily have connected the chemical reserves in the hollow and the horny crest. So, not saying it was, but it was possible. And it is interesting to speculate where the fire breathing monsters have some basis in reality. As I said, uh, if you go to the various cultures and all, there's almost a fire breathing dragon in, in many, many, many Asian countries. And few others. Uh, it's also interesting that we didn't know about, uh, I mean, can you, if there can be an electric eel or a firefly, I know those are not quite the same as fire, but looking in the ocean at all the bioluminescent creatures, how does all that happen? God created. Uh, of the many societies, why would somebody put that image, and that is in America, that is in the uh, National Forest in Flagstaff, Arizona, why would the Indians or those that lived in that region <clears throat> a few thousand years ago, how could they have envisioned something like this that certainly, to me anyway, looks like a fire-breathing fire dragon? Uh, and then Job 41 and 30 says his undersides are like sharp potsherds. He, he spreads pointed marks in the mire. Anybody recall the name of the colocanth? The fish that they thought was extinct for tens of millions of years that they found in the Indian Ocean in 1938. And then they, after they found it, they managed to send cameras down and take Take it, it wasn't just a a lone creature. It was there's many of them down there, and if you look at that uh, bony little point 
as they go along the bottom, it meets the definition that is in, uh, in Job. Now, is this what Job was talking about? I highly doubt it because of the size and some other description. But the scales on this thing are also so... Uh, actually, let me read this just so you, I make sure it's correct. The colocanth, another prehistoric feature of this unique, unique fish, are its scales. These highly modified scales are known as cosmoid scales and are only found on extinct fish species. Well, this one's not extinct anymore, so they really can't make that statement. But they are woven tight like armor and are rough to the touch. These hard scales help protect the fish from rocks and predators. So if this small fish can do it, why can't bigger fish do it? My people, as I'd mentioned. Job 40 and verse 16 says, His strength is in his loins, his force in the navel of his belly. Personally, when I look at the hippopotamus, I don't see strength in those loins, and I don't see strength in the belly. And it says he moves his tail like a cedar. I don't see that tail being like a cedar either, so I think we can automatically rule out the hippopotamus in that description. Then I'd mentioned the unicorn. If you go back to the film that we watched where they found the, uh, the brow horn of this dinosaur, a brow horn very much like a rhinoceros, they have two, but this one horn, could that not be what was referred to uh, as a unicorn? The brow horn, the one horn on that, that creature. Uh, like I said, this is the rhinoceros. They have the one big one and generally a smaller one just above that. Or was he talking about a fish, a whale? Anybody know, have heard about the narwhal? That one horn off the narwhal, and those are in existence today. You can find pods of them in certain, certain waters, and those things grow four or five feet long. Is that what was referred to? So it's not, even though the Bible does not use the word dinosaur, if you go back and look at all the creatures that we know exist and have existed, and then just think of some that we know the bones of that have gone extinct, can we adequately say, or can we draw a conclusion then that when God create everything, created everything, that included those things that we now call dinosaurs, and that they did roam the earth with man, and that many species did go extinct because of various reasons. And we do find bones because of sudden burying and fossilization. And, if, and talking about the rapid change, if you go to Arizona to the petrified forest, how does that exist? A forest means trees living. Everything's alive and growing. How does something become petrified? It has to be buried in a wet area under pressure, and now it's desert, so it's gone through at least three changes. Yes, sir. Right. Absolutely. I heard the bell ring. My time is, is there any quick questions or comments or anything? Thank you all so much for your time. Next week we'll be.